Well, how do the jumps? Tis I, Captain of the Steers. And as you can see, I've got my old TV there, and I'm hitting up the trailer of Acolyte Episode 6, I believe. So let's hit play on here. Pow, pow, boom, boom. So, Episode 5, there was quite a lot of action. Quite a lot of Jedis got slain. Now, what I don't really get about this episode is technically, you know, whenever a Jedi falls in battle, the higher Jedis, the master Jedis, feel a loss of the Force. Especially since this is a realm of peace. If any Jedis were to fall, surely they would understand who has fallen and how many. But it actually takes a holographic projection from Sol to the actual Jedi Council before they realise that there's just been a massive drop in the Force. Which is a little bit weird. So there was that that's a bit weird. But there were some things in this that I really think they got right. So the actual helmet that's, that the bad guy wears, uh, Chimere, and also the wrist cuff that actually damages the lightsabers and turns them off, is actually made out of a substance called cortosis. And inside of the Jedi-type lore, or the Star Wars lore, in a comic book, there's only one place where this stuff actually resides. And it's a strange planet where um, Darth Plagueis is actually from. So that stuff is called cortosis. It only grows, it's only on one planet. So it looks like this is setting up for the whole Darth Plagueis sort of element of story and lore and the arc. So I'm really hoping it takes us there inside a future episode. Now there's only two episodes left. Now there is a trailer for episode 7 out right now. And it looks like it's another flashback to the past. The real thing that happened in that coven of witches. So hopefully we're going to discover exactly what happened. I think it's going to be Sol's re-encounting of what happens. And it looks like the Wookiee is actually fighting Torbin. You know, the guy with a big uh, gash down his face. You just saw a little excerpt of it there. Anyway, looks like it's coming into, you know, episode 7. And I can't wait for episode 7. I mean, for all the criticism that this is having, I actually can't wait week on week to see what's going to happen next with this. I'm thoroughly enjoying it, to be fair. So yeah, despite the criticisms, like I just mentioned, I actually like this. I've, I've, I'm starting to see that it's got potential for Season 2. If they do bring in Darth Plagueis, I want to see more of the Darth Siths. I mean, yeah, the casting, the acting, the scripting, it, it hasn't been that great. But this whole power of two is starting to play in a bit. I mean, the power of two, the power of many. But at least this Sith guy, you know, Quimir, has actually mentioned that all he wants is the power of two. So he just wants an acolyte. He wants a pupil. So I, I don't know. Is he part of the witch's coven? Does he know of the witches? Was he on the planet? How did he actually come into contact with May? You know, all this is still sort of unanswered. But hopefully in episode 7 we're going to find out why Torbin topped himself. We're probably going to find out how he got that big scar down his face. And what actually happened in that coven of witches. And to be fair, I quite like this. The not knowing, and the twists and the, the, the plot changes. And if that planet is the planet from the lore of um, Darth Plagueis. And it is the only planet where you know Cortosis can be gathered. It could be that when we see um, Quimir go into the, the bathing pool there, maybe that's like BAFTA-type water, or back to water, you know, the one that sort of like makes you heal. Maybe he's a lot older than what we think he is. Because he's extremely powerful for a young Jedi. I know Anakin was super powerful, but, you know, he was the chosen one. They're not normally that powerful. He just took out a whole load of Jedi Masters like nothing. He's far stronger than Sol, even, you know? So, I think there's more to this than what we're understanding. And I'm wondering whether the actual Jedi Master that's got the laser whip, the Green Lady, I can't remember the name of right now, whether he might have been her Padawan, her learner. Because the actual scars on his back is like a Y shape. It looks like... Whoosh, whoosh. It looks like whip marks. It doesn't just look like a lightsaber. It's quite coarse. I'm wondering whether he was the pupil of her and she was the one that cast him aside. You know, and going up against these Jedis is a good way of getting back at her in a roundabout way. I don't know. There's a lot of this that I'm thinking, yeah, that's good. That's good. But there's other things that I'm like, that's not. That's really not. That's just laughably not. You know, the whole time that May is on the ship with Sol and she's got a big freaking tattoo on her head. You would have thought that he would have spotted that. Not only spotted it, but he's force sensitive. Surely he must know that that's not her. 
you know, he's even fought May in the streets. He's felt her force. He's felt her presence. Surely, you know, I mean, come on. It, 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 some bits were a bit laughable. It, it's like the little hamster guy, Basil. You know, he, he speaks a different sort of language, but he talked to the pit droid or whatever. But he tries to ambush May, knowing that she's taken out a whole load of Jedis. Well, two Jedis so far. And he knows he's no match for her. And, and he was trying to track her on the planet. Surely he would have maybe put her into an airlock, got her into there, rather than lure her into that little room. And all he did was step on her toes. <laughs> Should, it would have been better to have locked her in there, sealed her in somehow. There could have been a... I just don't... Really? There, there's just so many little mini plot holes in this, but this is a Disney movie type thing, isn't it? Ever since they've got hold of the Star Wars franchise, they've put these major plot holes in. It's just like they, they haven't really thought things through. Even the cartoons of Clone Wars were better than this. And, and that's saying something. I, mean, I actually quite like the Clone Wars. I mean, that's probably a disservice to the Clone Wars, to be fair. But I've seen fan-made films better than this when it comes to story and lore telling and all that sort of shenanigans. Comic books as well, you know, more thought out. <laughs> and they're just little snippets, you know. So, I don't know. Although that I'm saying that I'm, I'm starting to like this as much as Ashoka, that's all. It's about on par with Ashoka. Ashoka was equally as bad for the same reasons, but at least Ashoka also touched on elements of the lore, with the whole uh, Jedi's being learned, with Skywalker's little mini school, and I'm hoping that brings us up against those unknown beasts that can actually feed on the Force. Are they the unknown or uh, the unnamed or something like that? There's something weird like that, something vague. But they're really cool beasties inside of the comics. And I hope they get brought in. And it's part of the path of that hand or something. And there's also Wayfinders inside of the lore. Which technically, I think, Quimera is more of a Wayfinder than a Sith. Uh, I'm probably getting some of these sort of connotations and naming slightly wrong. But I think people that know the lore will know what I mean. I'm not a massive lore buff. Yes, I read some of the books. I read some of the comics. But I'm not an avid reader. So until it gets a film adaptation, I'm a little bit shite. I'm a little bit rusty. But I know enough to know that you know, Cortosis comes from one planet. It was like Baldactin or something. Sounds like a cleaning detergent. But that's where Darth Plagueis is from. And Darth Plagueis is pretty kick-ass. And he had a master that was even more kick-ass. And I think he killed his own master, if, if memory serves. I mean, I, I've not jumped on Google. I haven't Googled any of this. I'm just going by my own mind. And I don't like watching other people's reviews of this. I mean, I accidentally watched a couple of shorts a little while ago. Like episode 3 or something. Because it was going mental on episode 3. And a couple played in the background. I think it was Critical Drinker or something. And I am seeing that this is getting slated massively by people. Um, I don't know whether I'm a singular voice out there. Maybe I need to jump on and take a little look-see. See who else is actually chiming on about this. See if anybody else is seeing any positives in this. Um... But yeah, I just want to try and keep my my views and my reviews to be my own without any sort of, you know, interference from the outside world, which is extremely difficult with the amount of stuff that's banging about the Internet on this right now. So, yeah, I have seen a couple of snippets, especially from my own recommended list. So because I've put videos out on this, I've thought about it. They pop up, you know. Anyway, I haven't got a cup of tea right now. This is actually a, a hot chocolate, hot chocolate, people. I'm che cheating. It's actually a minty hot chocolate by Poppets. It's really nice. Proper nice. That's, that's that's really good. That's nice. That's lovely. Anyway, people, I'm going to end off now, but I just want you to know that Acolyte, I think if you wait for all eight episodes to be out, I mean, they're only like, what, 40 minutes each or something. You blink, they're over. I would wait until the whole of season one is out and watch them back to back and reserve your judgment because they do get better as as, as it goes on. And some of this hammy acting, you've got to remember that Disney is sort of putting this out there for family entertainment. So yeah, the plots and the actual twists and one minute they're good, one minute they're bad. You probably find the kids at home like, oh, I just, I just want the sisters to get back and be friends again. You know, that, that's kind of 
that's kind of what the writer was saying with the whole of the Frozen thing. She wants to have Frozen inside of Star Wars. So having one of the twin sisters end the other one just isn't going to happen, is it? You know, you've got to look at who wrote this and who they're sort of aiming it for. They're aiming it for the new generation that's coming into Star Wars and perhaps even females like girls that are trying to come into Star Wars, hence the main protagonist being girls. So you've just got to understand that the audience might be slightly different to before. Yes, who's this made for? Because... To be honest, I've got I've got nephews, I've got nieces, and if I said you want to watch Star Wars, the nephew's like, yeah, and the girl's like, hmm. no, no, I don't, no, no, I really don't. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I think it's quite a narrow banded audience that they're aiming for, and I honestly don't think they're going to recoup their money on this one. But at the same time, same with Ashoka, you know, same sort of thing. Um. If you're a real Star Wars fan and you want to be entertained and you want a plot that's actually deep rooted, go for Andor. Andor's freaking awesome. Loved Andor. And if you want something that's sort of in the middle and appeals to everybody that is for everyone, try Mandalore. Mandalorian. Season 1 and 2. Season 1 and 2, brilliant. Season 3, not as good, but it's still not bad. Okay? And then you've also got the Book of Boba. Mixed opinions on that. Kind of liked it, kind of didn't. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was okay. Well, it's Boba Fett. He's one of my favourite characters. How can I not like it? I liked it, didn't love it. But there you go. That's my sort of synopsis of all the Star Wars stuff that's been put out there by Disney. And I really like the Solo movie. Yeah, I was probably going to get crucified for saying that. But I also liked Andor because it ties really nicely into Rogue One. And Rogue One is one of my favourite Disney movies that they've done so far. Uh, sound up in the comments. Let you know. Let me know if you're sort of chiming. If you've got the, on the same page as me on this one, Ashoka and Acolyte. I'm going to put these two now quite closely together. I need to see what happens in the last two episodes before I finalise that and lock it in and concrete it. But right now, I think Acolyte has started to redeem itself. There's a few little twists. There's a few little nods. A few little nuances. A few combat scenes. Even in episode one, I loved the freaking choreography in the bar fight with the Trinity character. Great. Episode two, where uh, I think Sol faces off with May in the street. Again, beautifully choreographed. There are some nice elements in here. It's not all bad. If you're hearing bad across the net, now I've seen the, I've seen the Rotten Tomatoes review. I looked at that. The Rotten Tomatoes review is insanely bad. So it's got a long way to go if it's to climb the, the, those reviews again. But I'd imagine quite a lot of these critical reviews that have come out are probably buried this. Or people haven't watched it and just sounded off after watching the critical reviews rather than forming their own opinion. I like to sit and watch this with Ivy, because Ivy's not a massive Star Wars fan. She's come to Star Wars through me, and she's actually liking this a lot more than watching the boys. In fact, when I put the boys on now, she goes and does other things. So anyway, she scored this a 9 out of 10. I'm not that generous. I'll score this about 6.5 to a 7 out of 10, and I scored a Shoker a 7 out of 10. So it's nearly there. All right, people. Until next time. Goodbye, goodbye, and goodbye again.